Hello, you are listening to Island Girl. My name is Heather, and this is episode seven, A Turn of the Wheel. The cloppity cloppity of a hand-pushed cylinder lawn mower was one of the surest signs to herald the start of the spring season as far as Sylvianne was concerned. As a little girl, she would sit on a large, flat-top boulder in the rockery garden at her grandparents' house as her grandfather pushed his own mower up and down, up and down the striped lawn. She would spend hours chatting nonsense with him and he would point out little items of interest. They would discuss the merits of bees and the antisocial activities of the wasp and she would stand by his elbow as he pruned the honeysuckle and clematis. She had even sat with her own small trowel to help plant 200 lily of the valley bulbs with him over the entire space of her grandmother's grave. Her grandfather had taught her to love plants and insects and birds. He had bequeathed the English countryside to his granddaughter and she had loved him above everyone else for it. She couldn't imagine owning a hover mower. There was a pleasure all of its own to feeling the heavy blades slicing over the grass and it was the gardening job that she always felt was peculiarly hers. Her grandfather had taken her to Custer and Tor hardware store to help her select hers as a wedding present, like a family rite of passage. An old trusty still did the job today. As she wheeled it out of the garage, it glided perfectly because it had already had its annual service. Tom Hopkins, something of a village ob jobber, had checked the cutting deck for balance, touched up the blade edges with grinding compound and oiled the joints. The bulbous wooden handles had been worn smooth and shiny through years of use, but had still benefited from a stroke of Tom's handmade polish and it smelled honeyed from the beeswax. Sylvianne never felt gardening was a chore, and when she woke up this fine Saturday morning to see the glorious sunshine, which had some real strength behind it, she knew not only was this a day for the garden, she knew it was going to be a day to cherish. This really was the making of the perfect weekend. It had been a blessing to find Tom Hopkins. Stockard had never liked gardening, nor was he keen on sitting in it. He didn't enjoy the birds, the sticky summer heat, or the pollen and he certainly never intended to get down and dirty servicing gardening hardware or cleaning guttering. Tom Hopkins, however, for the cost of a few pints for his Saturday night, was more than happy to do both. Idly, Sylvianne pondered why it was that she'd never had the good sense to be attracted to men like Tom in her girlhood, honest, hard-working and useful men like her grandfather. Sylvianne began her slow and purposeful stride down her side lawn. She was wearing her favourite short-brimmed straw bonnet, its first outing this year. She was smiling faintly and waved cheerily to a young couple walking their toddler through the village passing by her gate. House martings were sweeping around the garden up in the eaves and out again with such speed that she acknowledged a tad ruefully they'd been making a real mess all down the wall sadly. Tom was a retired tenant farmer and widowed. When the doughty Mrs Hopkins had succumbed to an infection from a burst appendix, Tom took the opportunity to move to Bull Terrace in the village and very close to Framling House. Bull Terrace was a long row of two up, two down houses offered to retired estate workers at a peppercorn rate. In fact, very many of the houses on the outskirts of the village were now owned by the estate and easily recognised from the heritage grey paintwork and they were available to locals to rent at very reasonable rates. Every estate house in Upper Framling had a good sized garden plot and there was a waiting list for these well-maintained homes. The estate office which managed both the tenant farms which surrounded the village and the lettings of the outskirt properties was located in a small converted coach house in a shaded side area in the large estate park grounds of the Palladian Big House which dominated the eastern side of the village and was the ancestral seat of the Corswell family who were so well established they got a mention in the Doomsday Book but over time the name had been anglicised to the simpler Cassell. The Cassell family had had their own family tragedies to endure in recent years. The old lord had handed over the management of the estate to his eldest son, so he and his wife could enjoy more time in a small jeep they owned in the south of France in order to better enjoy the climate and improve Lady Cassell's arthritis. However, their retirement had been short-lived, with their son's untimely death in a motorcycle accident, and they were forced to return to the hall until their younger son was in a position to take over duties, which he had done last year, 
and the old lord and lady moved into a latterly unused large farmhouse which was very close to the hall. Caspar Cassell's headstone was without artifice and it's his pot plot kept neat and trim with flowers replaced weekly. But he remained aloof in death as he had in life, his position slightly aside from the main body of headstones in the churchyard, and looked sad and lonely, a young man cut off in his prime. Undone with grief, Lady Cassell tended the plot assiduously and dwelt in misery, refusing to return to the dream of their comfortable French retirement. The wheel of the year turned in Upper Framling as it had over centuries. The fabric of the village weaved from the lives and times of the people living in the village and the surrounding hundred. Sylvianne bent to look under a buddleia sh shrub to, retrie to retrieve an escaped Orpington hen scurrying into the thicket under there, who belonged to the household opposite. The hen squatted her fat fluffy body flat and waited to be retrieved. Sylvianne grabbed her firmly, holding the wings close in so as not to cause injury. She walked over the road to the large stone-built house and peeked over the beach heading to see Hugh busy setting up his barbecue. He was fixing trays and didn't see her approach. Crikey, Hugh, this is an early start to the season. He looked up and stopped his preparations. Hi, Sylvianne. He nodded towards the docile Orpington sat in her hands. One of ours. He peered at it closer. He had no idea. The birds belonged to his wife. Sylvianne held the bird toward him and nodded. This is Mabel, I think. Hugh had no bloody idea. They really were all the same to him. But he backed off slightly at her offering. He had no plans to hold the thing. Still holding his utensils, he waved tongs towards the house. Carol is in the kitchen. Do you want to take her to her to there? She smiled, understanding his sudden reticence. I'll just pop her in the back of the coop room. Sylvianne returned the bird and Hugh shouted over towards her. I thought it was a good time to unleash the beast, he said on a chuckle, pointing with the tongs to the enormous gas-driven barbecue. Early season MOT. Although I don't think the sunshine will hold out long enough to actually have a full-on barbecue today. Sylvianne eyed the machine, which took up the whole right side of his patio area. I think you're right, Hugh. Unless you're planning on lunch out here, it's more than warm enough for that, even if dinner is out of the question. She wasn't a fan of barbecues, really, but it had given her an idea. Hugh went back to the task in hand, and when Sylvianne returned back over the road, she put old Trusty back into the garage and pulled out the power washer. Connecting up the leads, she wasn't surprised to find the water pressure had dropped. That always happened when everyone was out with the hoses. But there was sufficient surge to clear the winter moss away from the patio slabs. The whole area was dry before she'd finished, and the difference to the whole area was amazing. She then pulled out the ornate white enamelled outdoor table and chairs from her shed. Taking off the coverings, she decided to dispense with the parasol. She wanted to feel the sun on her skin, not hide from it. It had been so long waiting for it to return. She brought out a Madeira cake and put the kettle on and strolled over to the fence to see if she could tempt Ellen to join her. But there was nothing. Where the hell was she? Sylvianne went back to make tea. Madeira cake was always best with tea. Sylvianne sat and pulled her hat off. Shaking her hair, she closed her eyes and faced the sunbeams. They really had some afternoon punch. Mad dogs and Englishwomen, she thought, as her face drank in the warmth. With her eyes still closed, she inhaled the smell of freshly mowed grass. She was blessed not to suffer grass pollen allergies, and she loved the smell of cut grass. There were wood pigeons cooing in the horse chestnut canopy that clustered around the village. Sylvianne slowly opened her eyes. She picked up her tea. She'd even gone to the trouble of getting out china cup and saucer. As she sipped, she faced over towards Ellen's cottage. Maybe she'd gone to stay at Josie's, her daughter. Had she said? Sylvianne scoured her thoughts but couldn't recall. It was altogether likely that Ellen had told her and she hadn't been paying attention. Too much of that of late had been the order of Sylvianne's day. She hated that she had become so self-absorbed she hadn't taken a note of what her friend had been saying. Now she had stopped, she felt inclined to sit and just enjoy the afternoon sunshine. She consigned any more thoughts of gardening to the back of her mind. This had the makings of a lazy afternoon. 
The sun didn't last much beyond four o'clock and brought out an immediate chill. But it had been a charming afternoon and Sylvianne was basking in the pleasure of her weekend. Checking through the fridge, the decision as to what to eat for dinner was a tricky one because she really couldn't face any complicated cooking. She just wasn't finding any inspiration and had just given up surveying the fridge shelves when a car caught her eye. Pulling into Ellen's drive, Sylvianne closed the fridge door and looked out of the window. She watched Josie manoeuvre her large car into the driveway next door. Ah, Ellen was home. Sylvianne smiled. She also decided to forget rummaging for meal inspiration to leap out and grab her. Beans on toast would work a treat. Tea time was going to be early, as all she'd eaten all day was that single piece of Madeira cake, and she realised that while she couldn't be bothered with the cooking, she wasn't averse to the eating. There was something peculiarly wholesome about beans on toast, she thought, maybe because it reminded her so strongly of being at home, pampered by her own mum, the perfect pre-homework snack the western world over. She sat at her kitchen table, musing over nothing in particular. It was nice to have simple, unharried thoughts for once. What might she do with her evening, she pondered, and what might she do with her Sunday to come? The weather promised to deteriorate overnight, which squashed any idea of the kind of lightweight gardening she had a liking for, pottering and puttering about. So instead, she had half a mind to use the promised rainy showers to sit herself down, properly sit down, just herself with a notepad and make a plan. She hadn't planned a damn thing all her life. She had discussed plans with Stockhard. They had been downright strategic at times. But not her. Not really her. Her life was buffeted by the winds of change, usually caused by someone else's decision-making. But that could change. It was never too late and, well, about time. Sylvia Ann collected herself together and placed her plate into the dishwasher. She'd sort that all out later. For now, her evening was calling to her and she made her way through to the lounge. This evening, she wanted to do nothing but sit and watch telly. Mindless programmes that made her laugh or might make her think, but nothing that was either too heavy or tearful. Just something fluffy and fun would do nicely. En route to her chair, she saw a small collection of her neighbours standing by her gate. Mrs Lawton from next door but three, with her West Island Terriers, Hugh from across the way, and, and was that Josie? She couldn't see without going and standing in the window bay, and she really didn't want to make it so obvious that she was staring at them all. She wondered what the little gaggle were doing, but right now she wasn't in the mood to go and see. Had she had gone to the window, she would have seen all these people all the more clearly seen the solemnity, and even seen the police car parked further down the road. All that, and Josie's grief-stricken face. Thank you. Thank you.